We live in an age of near limitless information, which on the one hand is fantastic. We can, theoretically, learn anything we want to about, well, anything. On the other hand, with so much content and information to sift through, it's inevitable that some things are going to slip through the cracks. Today I'm going to be going over five financial videos that I wish got more attention than they did. If any of them sound interesting to you, be sure to check out the links I'll be leaving to each of those videos in the description below. So without further ado, let's get started. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a link to the investing platform M1 Finance. Get started investing for free today. The first video I wish got more attention than it did is Why the First $100,000 is So Hard and the Next is So Easy by Chris Invests. It has garnered quite a bit of attention since it was uploaded on November 21st, 2021, but I'd love to see it get even more. As the title suggests, the video discusses the growing pains associated with the early stages of growing your wealth, as well as what you can do to speed up the journey to that first major investing milestone. In the video, Chris lays out a handful of obstacles that make the first milestone of $100,000, or whatever amount, so much harder to reach than the milestones that follow. The first obstacle is that it's easy to put off investing when retirement seems so far away, and there are so many other priorities that seem much more urgent. This is especially true when we consider that our incomes tend to be lower when we first start working than they are when we've got years of experience in our fields. Therefore, we theoretically have less wiggle room in the budget for investing than we will in the future. The second is that investing can seem too risky. This can seem like the case for a couple of reasons. First, because of the tightness of the budget as discussed earlier. Losing money in the short term tends to matter a lot more when we're just barely getting by and may not even have things like a fully funded emergency fund yet than it does when we have hundreds of dollars of cushion in the budget every month. To go along with a fully funded emergency fund and maybe even some sinking funds in place for large upcoming expenditures. The second is because we view risk through a narrower lens than we realistically probably should. This isn't entirely our fault. I mean, in the financial media, risk is often illustrated by volatility. Investments that are more volatile are generally considered to be more risky, and to be fair, that is true in the short term, especially for those who are anxious about their investments, which tends to be more common in those who are new to the investing world and or have a tighter budget. However, that's not the only type of risk that we face financially. There's also the risk of falling short of our goals, whether that be a retirement goal, a vacation, or a down payment fund on a home. And avoiding investing due to its short-term risks can increase the long-term risks of falling short of these larger goals, since it'll mean that we have less time in the markets to let our investments compound and grow. That can easily lead us to taking on investments that have more of the boom and bust potential than we otherwise would in order to make up for some lost time down the road. The third obstacle is just simple mathematics. Simply put, the first $100,000, or $1 million, or again, any wealth milestone, is usually going to be the hardest to reach because the bulk of the work has to be done by you. Think about it. If you earn 10% per year on your investments, then you'd be growing your net worth by about $1,000 a year if you had built up a $10,000 net worth. If you add $100,000 put into your investments, you'd be earning $10,000 a year on average. At $200,000, you'd be earning $20,000, and so on and so forth. This chart shows the amount of time, and money out of pocket, it takes to reach each subsequent $100,000 net worth milestone, assuming an investor contributed $500 a month and earned an average return of 5% per year. As you can see, both in terms of time and money contributed out of our own pockets, each subsequent milestone is easier and quicker to attain than the last. A fourth obstacle Chris mentions in the video is that there's a positive feedback loop that occurs for investors as their net worth continues to grow, but it isn't really there, at least in as meaningful of a way, in the beginning. Once your net worth reaches a certain point, you really begin to get excited by the progress it's making each and every year. Sure, a 10% return on a $5,000 nest egg is nice and all, but at the end of the day, it's still only $500. Many of us could earn that with a bit of extra hours of overtime, but a 10% return on $100,000? Now that's quite a noticeable boost to your net worth, and for many, a sizable portion of their income for the year. Seeing this substantial progress happening in such a short span helps helps to encourage us to find ways to invest more money and speed that progress up even more. This can come in the form of thinking of ways to increase your income, becoming more financially efficient and decreasing your spending, or increasing your returns, but the results are the same. The positive feedback loop encourages you to try and get the most out of this great thing that's happening with your finances. Additionally, due to the fact that you have more wiggle room financially after building up a sizable investing portfolio, you may feel more comfortable jumping into opportunities that would have seemed too risky before. 
such as starting up a side hustle or business, taking advantage of a great real estate opportunity, or taking a position that's largely commission-based but has a potentially much higher income ceiling if things go well. So the lack of such a wide variety of viable financial opportunities could be considered another obstacle that gradually fades away as you reach each successive milestone. And finally, there's just no getting around the fact that you become more experienced as an investor, and probably budgeter, as time goes along and your net worth continues to grow. Therefore, hopefully, you get a little bit better at all the skills that go into increasing your net worth as time goes along, which makes it easier to be more consistent financially and reach those later milestones even faster. The second video that I wish got more attention than it did is The Difference Between Saving 5% and 20% of Your Income by Aaron Tox Money. It examines the almost unbelievable impact that a small increase in your savings rate can have on your ability to not only reach financial independence, but do it quickly. It's a really eye-opening video because, as you can see from this chart, it really doesn't take much of a boost in savings to cut a large chunk of time off your journey to reaching financial independence. Now this chart is a little different from what Erin did in her video, mainly because I'm using slightly different assumptions for the investing returns. I'm using 5% to be a little conservative and account for inflation. She used 8%, which is definitely a based on history, even after inflation, assuming you have a fairly aggressive allocation, but it gets the same point across. As you can see, increasing your savings rate from 5% to 10% shaves off nearly a decade and a half from the time it takes you to reach financial independence under these assumptions. Going from 10% to 15% shaves off nearly another full decade and gets us to around the length of an average working career, which is why most financial experts recommend saving between 15 and 20% of your income for retirement. As you continue to increase your savings rate, the time it takes to reach financial independence continues to decrease. The reason for this is twofold. First, you're putting more money into your investments, which obviously helps them to grow faster, and second, you're simultaneously lowering the amount of money you need to maintain your lifestyle in retirement, since once you reach retirement, you no longer need to be saving money for retirement. Basically, the underlying assumption is that if you're saving 10% of your income, you're living on the other 90%. And if you're saving 50% of your income, you're proving that you really only need half of what you're earning in order to get by. The third video I wish got more attention than it did is How to Pay Off Your Mortgage Early by 10 Years by Dennis Trufin of the True Financials channel. It takes a look at some of the things that you can do to pay off your mortgage early, what impacts that can have on the amount of money you ultimately pay in interest when all is said and done, as well as discussing some reasons why that may, or may not, be something that you want to do depending on your financial situation. What I really like about this video in particular is that it touches on some things that not everyone considers when it comes to this pay it off early versus pay the minimums and invest the rest debate. Namely, the fact that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing decision, and the idea that the monetary difference between the returns you'd expect to make in your investments and the interest rate on the mortgage can be partially, or depending on how your investments perform during your specific payoff period, entirely made up by the extra cash flow you free up once the mortgage is paid off. This is something I've covered at length in previous videos on this channel, so I won't go too far into the weeds here, but that's not something that everyone considers. And we should, because even though, more often than not, returns from investing in the stock market have historically trounced the interest rates on most mortgages over the long term, and therefore paying the minimums and investing the rest would have been the better choice mathematically, they haven't always done that and sometimes it can take a while for them to pull ahead. Think of someone who bought a new home in 1999 or 2000. The following decade would have been pretty rough had they decided to pay the minimums and invest the rest. It wouldn't necessarily have sunk them financially, let's not be crazy, but it also probably wouldn't have gotten them as much ahead as they thought they would have been compared to if they had paid a little extra on their mortgage during those years. Now, as I've covered in previous videos, the length of the payoff period plays a big role here. If you're able to pay off your loans in a shorter time span, say within a handful of months or maybe even a year or two, the likelihood of getting much excess benefit from paying the minimums and investing the rest becomes a lot more suspect than it does with loans, like mortgages, that often take many years to fully pay off even with focused effort. But obviously, markets can struggle for a while from time to time, so it is a factor that's still worth taking into consideration. And that's just the mathematical side of things. Then you also need to take into consideration things like the risks associated with unfortunate events, and the emotional and psychological benefits that you may or may not be receiving when you no longer have a giant payment hanging around your neck. Obviously, when it comes to these more circumstantial and experiential things, the mileage may vary from person to person, but it is worth thinking about when making your decision all the same. The fourth video I wish got more attention than it did is 11 Money Traps to Avoid at All Costs by Sarah Wilson of the Budget Girl channel. The video is exactly what you'd think based on the title. It goes over a bunch of money traps and mistakes that many of us make, or have made, at one point or another, and why we should do everything we can to avoid them as much as possible in the future. Not a whole lot more to say there, just a good foundational reminder piece 
expertise covering things that we should keep in mind when navigating our own financial journeys. The fifth, and for today, final video I wish got more attention than it did, is Dealing with Investment FOMO by Richard from The Plain Bagel. Similar to the video from Chris Invests earlier, it has gotten a pretty good deal of attention since it was uploaded in January 2021, but I'd still love to see it get even more, because especially in this day and age, knowing how to deal with the fear of missing out on investment opportunities that appear to be going to the moon is incredibly important. In the video, Richard discusses what causes investing FOMO, the cognitive and behavioral biases that are often working against us when we choose to act out of those fears of missing out, and how we can better temper our responses to more reliably reach our financial goals in this crazy world of investing. One of the biggest causes of investing FOMO is a combination of regret aversion, recency bias, hurting bias, motivated reasoning, and our own tendency to showcase our life through filters. Regret aversion comes into play when we make a decision for the purposes of avoiding regretting something in the future, such as when people jump into a market run-up in order to avoid regretting missing out on the gains of that run-up that they expect to continue into the future. This is often a very tempting proposition for those who have already been following the investing world for long enough to have seen at least one major run-up in the past, because at that point they know how huge the potential gains can be. Of course this can also work the other way when people get stung from jumping into an investment run-up too late and experience little of the gains and almost all of the correction that often comes afterward. Those individuals may be far less likely to hold on to their investments or maybe even invest at all in the next market run-up. It may end up hurting them financially in the longer term, since they aren't investing consistently, but, so the logic goes, at least they avoid getting themselves into a situation where they're regretting their inaction during a market run-up when the investments end up falling by 30% or more. Recency bias is the tendency to put more weight on recent information when making decisions. We see this in basically every market cycle. An investment builds momentum and achieves strong gains for a little while, and, if enough hype builds up around it, we all seem to briefly lose our collective minds as investors and start funneling more and more money into that investment. That is, until a segment of investors come back to their senses and start selling their shares, thus slowing that momentum down and beginning the correction. Here's a chart that illustrates the influence of recency bias in the investing world quite clearly. It shows the percentage of investing inflows and outflows, i.e. buying shares and selling shares, of stocks in the stock market based on their performance the previous year. As you can see, in most years, the majority of the inflows, i.e. buying shares are funneled into the stocks that performed best the previous year, while the majority of outflows, i.e. selling shares, come from those that struggled in the previous year. Unfortunately, what this means is that many investors end up buying high and selling low, which is one of the reasons why it's been so hard historically for investors to beat the markets over extended periods of time. Hurting bias reflects our tendency to follow the crowd without taking into consideration our own judgment. It's basically the idea that we go with the decisions of others as opposed to our own gut because we feel there's safety and wisdom in numbers, which admittedly is the case sometimes, but not always, and especially not when irrational exuberance, or pessimism, has taken over. Our own tendency to showcase our life through filters tends to lead to us touting our successes while minimizing, or sometimes outright ignoring, our failures. In the investing world this usually takes the form of bragging about the time we invested in company XYZ and doubled or tripled our money in under a year, while downplaying or ignoring the fact that we also invested in several other companies during that time that failed to even tread water. Because the things we often see or hear from others only reflect the successes, we can get an inaccurate view of the reality for most investors, which can increase the fear of missing out on the next investment craze because not only is everyone getting in on it, this is that hurting bias again, but we've also been conditioned to think that these things are easier to succeed at than they really are. Remember, hindsight is 2020. And finally, motivated reasoning is quite simply our tendency to try and find ways to bolster arguments and positions that will benefit us in some way. This is why scientific studies often list where they got their funding. Even if they're not trying to, incentives can alter how we perceive things. In the investing world this often takes the form of making claims that serve to puff up, or downplay, an investment that you own or have shorted. Again, it doesn't need to be malicious, it can just be that you're excited about a company and want to see it do well, so you focus more on the positives of their financial or competitive reality than you would have otherwise. When that information spreads, it can build up more hype than is really warranted which often leads to a quick run-up and usually a pretty rough fall. This makes it all the more important to take a step back when we need to, do our due diligence, and ensure that when we're creating our investing and financial plans, it aligns with our needs, goals, risk tolerance, and time horizon. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. 
Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.